or in the low density case, it was five orders of magnitude. So it's a half a order of magnitude difference between these two cases, both of which well are well conserved, but much more safe than the safety requirements require. About approximately 100,000 times safer than the goal. Next slide, please. Uh, today, all plants in the United States have procedures to deal with loss of spent fuel pool inventory. We've always had procedures to do that. As a result of the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States, the security-related orders require additional safety measures to be taken. We put in place additional equipment and procedures to deal with that. Uh, and the study takes credit for those. What the site does not take credit for is now we have the flexible diverse equipment required as a result of the Fukushima plant, a Fukushima uh, accident at all of our facilities. We also have procedures in place to deal with this and equipment still coming on site. For example, Dominion sites, we have equipment at all the sites today to deal with that issue. Um, we're also going to have regional support centers. The Memphis Center is already established. The Phoenix Center will be established by this uh, first half of this year. In addition to that, there's 62 other sites available to borrow equipment from to provide water. The bottom line is that uh, this is not a complicated mitigation, nor is it difficult. It's simply just add water. That's what the consequence is. That's what the, the compensatory mitigation is. Next slide, please. The NRC staff, and they so conservatism in their analysis. Each layer was designed to favor expedited fuel offload. Uh, even with all those conservatisms added and the favorability added to it, it didn't really result in any change here. Um, very conservative analysis were used, as I mentioned earlier, for spent fuel pool liner fragility or how easily the liner would tear. Uh, very large earthquake was used. In the high density case, mitigation was assumed. In other words, you could go in and add water easily or spray the pool down. In the low density case, mitigation was assumed to not be successful. That assumption alone adds a factor of 19 to the case difference. That's a big difference there. Next slide, please. I mentioned over the decades there's been numerous studies that have, have analyzed the spent fuel pools, existing high density configurations, and all determine that they'd be extremely safe with considerable margin to the, to the requirements, to the safety goals. Um, we, all, we have seen a number of cases where the seismic event has exceeded the capacity designed into spent fuel pools. And we found from the North Anna earthquake, there's tremendous conservatisms even in the codes used. I'll give you a quick example. One of the non-safety buildings that houses our station blackout diesel at North Anna, we put that earthquake into the design basis code for the building, and it said the building would collapse because of the conservatisms in the design code. Now, the building did not collapse. It actually had zero damage to it. So the design codes have significant margins built directly into them. And this isn't an accident analysis code, this is design code. They're not, not intended to analyze accidents that occur or events that occur. It's easy to get off track and focus on the consequences of these events without looking at the probabilities. And the probabilities are very, very important in this case. We're seeing numbers like one in 10 billion per year, one in a trillion per beer per, per year. These kind of numbers, engineers have a hard time saying this, but they're effectively zero. When you get that many zeros in front of a decimal point, it's effectively zero. One in a trillion is a very, very small number. Madam Chairman, that concludes my remarks. 30 seconds to spare. Thank you. I like it. Good keeping us on time here. That's great. All right. Next up, we have Christine King, who's director of... Uh, the Nuclear and Fuel Chemistry Activities at the Electric Power Research Institute. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, not only about the expedited transfer, but what we're doing at EPRI uh, in terms of research around spent fuel pool or spent fuel management. Um, next slide, please. A necessary and important task associated with the operation of the nuclear power plant is the management of spent fuel. It has become necessary to transfer spent fuel from the pools to dry storage. At this time, fuel is transferred from the pool to dry storage at a pace to keep up with to support refueling operations for the reactors. Accelerating this pace requires a multifaceted evaluation um, and has been evaluated by multiple organizations. 
There are numerous factors to be evaluated and balanced as a decision is reached whether expedited transfer from the pool to dry storage improves the safe storage of nuclear spent fuel. Not only has EPRI evaluated the expedited transfer and spent fuel, but today I'd also like to talk to you about what we're doing in our current and future research programs. Next slide, please. The EPRI study models representative plants as well as looking at an industry-wide impact of acceleration. It's difficult to determine what factors should dominate a decision associated with acceleration. Assuming a particular spent fuel pool or spent fuel inventory for the fleet, we did evaluate how accelerated transfer would impact operations, drive the potential need for design changes in the casks and or the isfaces, I'm sorry, independent spent fuel storage installations, um, and the spent fuel inventory in the pool, and how that changes the decay heat and the cesium-137 inventory in the pool. However, our study does not address uh, how to maintain off-site dose at its current limits if you're going to load shorter cooled fuel. We did not address additional inventory from new plants, even though we realize that's a likely reality here in the United States. And we did not attempt to quantify the risk associated with the increased fuel handling activities. Um, so what we looked at is a base case, and the base case is basically the pace at which we're transferring spent fuel from the pool today to dry storage. And then we looked at a 10-year case starting in 2015 and a 15-year case starting in 2015 as well. We did not attempt to optimize the timing here. We didn't look to see how fast could it be done. We just evaluated a couple scenarios to see what the impacts would be. Um, along with some of the other assumptions made, uh, we did have to uh, assume what the spent fuel discharges would be, how high would the burn-up be. Um, we did look at the dry storage requirements and the technology and whether using existing technology you short load or whether we could, in, in the timing of each case, whether we could license new canister designs and have a uh, work with the higher heat load fuel that would be expected. We looked at the available time, um, whether it was a single unit site or a multiple unit site. What is the available time to actually load new casks and the associated worker dose with that? And we looked at the cost for construction of additional casks and the increased shielding inside the cask. We did not look at any modifications to the actual pad or changes to the site boundaries because of uh, increased dose out in the dry storage. Next slide, please. So our study indicates that you can get a large reduction in the inventory in the spent fuel pool up to 75%. This is coupled with a reduction in the cesium-137 source term up to 53%. However, accelerating the transfer only provides for at most a 32% reduction in the decay heat for the pool. Um, to achieve these results, it does require loading additional canisters uh, upwards of 100 canisters uh, above our what we're doing today. Um, it, it did involve increased worker dose, and as I mentioned before, a potential change in the public dose. Um, EPRI has completed other studies associated with this issue. For example, um, we recently have published a risk framework for the spent fuel pool and piloted that on a BWR plant. We've evaluated the Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool following the tsunami and earthquake, <laughs> and we continue to follow the NRC's research on spent fuel pool fires. The cost associated with doing expedited transfer by our estimates is an additional $3.5 billion to the industry. Um, if you were to break that down to one particular plant, um, you're looking on the order of 20 to $30 million to affect the expedited transfer. Um, next slide, please. Given the DOE's current strategy for storage of uh, used nuclear fuel, extended storage of spent fuel at plant sites will be necessary until the plants are decommissioned. Our experience with aging management of the operating plant leads us to proactively plan for aging 
degradation of the dry storage systems to ensure that we fill any technology or knowledge gaps prior to any indication of degradation. EPRI's program is focused on understanding the fundamental behavior of fun fuel cladding as it cools, the management of the dry storage systems themselves, and ensuring that we develop the data necessary to support transportation after long-term storage. We've worked with our extended storage collaboration program, uh, which has uh, is an open program with regulators, international regulators, uh, research organizations from across the globe to develop um, a research gap list and prioritize that. As such, one of the highest priority gaps we had was uh, associated with high burn up fuel cladding properties. And we recently initiated a full scale demonstration project with the DOE to study how the high burn up fuel cladding responds to long term storage, which eventually um, Dave here is going to nicely host at North Anna. Uh, we expect the project to take about 10 years to complete but it should provide the industry the necessary confirmatory data to support storage and transportation of high burn up fuel. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, there are numerous factors that need to be evaluated and balanced relative to his decision on expedited fuel transfer from the pool to dry storage. And whether this improves to the safe storage of nuclear spent fuel. EPRI's research will be focused on proactively evaluating the need for aging management of the dry storage systems themselves and preparing for the day when we need to fully load casks with high burn up fuel since that's what we're discharging from our plants today. And I'd just like to go on record to say I beat you. You have two and a half minutes back. <laughs> right. Even better. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very informative. All right, we are now going to hear from Dr. Gordon Thompson, who's a research professor at Clark University and the executive director of the Institute for Resource and Security Studies up in Cambridge. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have this slide. Thank you. Um, my presentation is supported by three declarations that... Uh, I've asked to be distributed to the commissioners that were produced on behalf of a uh, consortium of environmental groups around the United States. But this presentation is strictly my own uh, views. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a low density rack. Uh, the NRC staff <coughs> appears to have uh, forgotten what a low density rack uh, uh, looks like. Uh, these used to be standard. Uh, in my view, it's a <clears throat> reasonably respectable piece of nuclear engineering, uh, passively safe against uh, water loss under most circumstances. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't expect you to read all the detail of this uh, slide on the screen, but um, the point is that the staff has looked at only a small fraction of the possible scenarios that could lead to loss of water in the event of an accident or an attack and I'll return to the probabilities of these events uh, later. So there's a large number of scenarios that are just not addressed at all in staff analysis to date. Next slide, please. This uh, slide shows a situation of partial loss of water from a spent fuel pool, which I describe as the severe reference case. This represents many possible scenarios for loss of water, and for three decades plus, the NRC has refused to systematically study this case. Even though there has been a partial precedent uh, in the PAX-2 accident in Hungary in 2003. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, what I describe as ignition delay time, which is uh, the shortest time required for spent fuel to heat up to the point of circular ignition. Uh, this shows that we're dealing with a relatively slow developing uh, incident uh, for fuel aged 1,000 days, a little over three years. We're looking at 21 hours in the fastest case for heat up. So you might think if the accident is so, or the incident is so slow developing, why should we worry about it? Next slide, please. This gives a hint as to why we might worry about it. Uh,